We pray this in your name, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. If you could start your life over and you got to choose your parents, what would they be like? Now, I need to be careful because my parents are actually here this morning. Uh, But when I was a teenager, I was really mad at them because they were not taller. And I wanted to play in the NBA, and at barely 5'10", that was not going to cut it. Uh, But maybe you wish your parents had been taller, or maybe you wish they had been shorter, or that their ears were smaller, or that maybe they just had more money to give to you. Or maybe you just wish that they had stayed together, or that they'd had more time for you, or that they hadn't had that addictive personality. Well, we don't get to choose our parents, do we? It's, it's an interesting thing about God that he, at the very beginning of our lives, he basically says, here, your emotional, physical, and spiritual well-being will be tied to these two people for the rest of your life. Okay, thanks. But there was one person who did get to choose his parents, and that was Jesus Christ. Jesus got to choose where and to whom he was born. Now, there were, there were parameters, right? According to the prophecies of the Old Testament, he had to have been born into a Jewish family in a certain part of the world. But still, Jesus chose, think about who he chose. He chose a poor carpenter and a teenage girl living in a, a backwater town. In, in a part of an oppressed nation. They weren't even married. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I think sometimes we have this, such a polished view of Christmas, sort of like a Thomas Kincaid painting. Oh, look at the sweet baby Jesus and his angelic parents and the cattle softly lowing. And yet the first Christmas was not like that at all. And I think one of the best things we can do is at Christmas time, is actually to knock some of the shine off of the Christmas story. One of my favorite songs, Christmas songs, is by Andrew Peterson. It's called Labor of Love. The words sound like this. It was not a silent night. There was blood on the ground. You could hear a woman cry in the alleyway that night on the streets of Davidstown. The stable was not clean, and the cobblestones were cold. And little Mary, full of grace, with the tears upon her face, had no mother's hand to hold. Jesus' birth was not a pretty sight. And this woman that he had chosen to be his mother would have, we can only imagine, was terrified. And yet, in the Gospel of Luke, we read that that Mary was actually seemed like a quite remarkable young woman. And we're going to look at some of her words, which reveal some of her understanding of who God is and her knowledge of the Bible. And we're going to look at, uh, this is Luke 1. It's known as Mary's song. It's often called the Magnificat, which is the Latin translation of the first line of this song. The, the, um, my soul magnifies the Lord. This is one of the most sung pieces of, of Scripture in church history. Everyone from Bach to John Ritter has put it to music. And it comes during the second of two significant events in Mary's early life. The first, of course, is when an angel appears to her. The angel Gabriel appears to her and tells her that she's going to have a child through the work of the Holy Spirit and that that child is going to sit on King David's throne forever. And then the second event is when Mary goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who is carrying John the Baptist. And Elizabeth tells her that she is blessed because she is the mother of the Lord and because she believed that the Lord would do what he said he would do. And so right after Elizabeth says these things, Mary 
begins to speak. If you are able, please stand for this reading of God's Word. Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. From, for behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, first thing we should notice about this song is that Mary shows in it a deep understanding of her place in history, her place in the story of God's redemption, particularly as it plays out through the Old Testament, which is the Bible that she would have had at the time. She understands that God's salvation plan is long. In verses 54 and 55, she goes back 1,800 years to Abraham. Abraham, uh, if you remember in the book of Genesis, was the man that God gave the initial promises for the nation of Israel to. He promised him that he would give him the holy land, the promised land. He promised that he would be the father of many nations and that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And Mary calls back to those promises. And she says, in essence, that what's happening to her is fulfilling those promises to Abraham. And now you might think, well, you know, isn't that, that's the Old Testament, right? That's about Israel, the nation of Israel. What does that have to do with me? Well, if you're a Christian, it has everything to do with you. Because Jesus is the ultimate key to understanding the promises that God gave to Abraham. You see, everyone thought Isaac was the child of promise that was given to Abraham um, and to Sarah. And that it was a miracle that they could have him in their old age. And it was. And he was the child of promise. But here's the thing. Isaac died without fulfilling the promises. And yet the promises went on to his heir and on through the generations. But still, as you read the Old Testament, you ask, how did these promises to Abraham come true? And Mary tells us that Jesus is the true child of promise who would make Abraham's influence go from just one nation, the nation of Israel, to becoming a global influence. Because without Jesus, Abraham is really only the father of Israel. A limited number of people, but through Jesus, all the nations of the world are blessed. And he becomes the father of many nations. And the number of believers who are spiritual children of Abraham are innumerable. Remember that kid's song? Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. And you are one of them, and so am I, if you are a believer in Jesus. Wherever Jesus is being trusted that's where the promises of abraham are coming true his he is the physical and the spiritual heir of god's uh, of abraham and god's covenant with abraham and this was god's plan all along he was playing the long game right working it out through this small group of people in the just the middle of these many other nations 
He's playing, God's playing the long game, but he knows what he's doing. Now, certainly his plan doesn't follow what we would expect. Because if you and I were to try to save the world, how would we do it? We would probably start from the top, right? With people with power and money and financial and political connections. But Jesus doesn't start there. God doesn't start there, does he? In fact, Mary tells us that God's salvation humbles the powerful. It humbles the proud. One of the things that strikes me about Mary's song is that it, it's political in a sense. Right? Look at verse 52. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones. Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 13 that God puts kings and rulers in their places. And he also has the power to remove them from their places. He is active in a political sense. Now, not always the, the political sense that we think, right? God does not line up with our political parties necessarily as we see them. And we may not always like the way that he works in the spheres of governments and nations, but he is working in that global sense. But along with that, we also see that Mary's song is very personal. Verse 50. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He's filled the hungry with good things. The rich he has sent away empty. It's interesting. I think in America we think it's that God is, is either or, right? That he's either personal or he's political. The gospel is either for individual or it's for the good of whole people groups. If you're a conservative Christian, you say the gospel is personal, it's individual. And if you're a liberal, liberal Christian, you say well, God's work is primary political or, so, or social. But Mary, I think, is a more holistic thinker. Because Jesus isn't an either or. In this case, he's a both and. He, his work affects of individuals, and it also affects a nation, nations. The first two psalms, which were the prayer book of Israel, I think they demonstrate this really well. Psalm 1, it's about an individual. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. His delight is in the law of the Lord. But then Psalm 2, it's about nations. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? God will terrify them in his fury. This this song asks us, how, how big is your God? Is he big enough to change the destiny of individuals, the lives of the worst sinners? Is he big enough to change the destiny of nations? Mary tells us he's both. And Mary tells us something that God hates, which is human pride. Verses 51 and 52. He has shown strength with his arm. He scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. Brought down the mighty from their thrones. So human pride in the face of God's strength, in the face of God's glory, is the ultimate foolishness. Either in individuals or in nations. Have you ever looked, just taken time and looked at the stars and considered your place in the universe? How small we are. We don't even have the power to control what may happen an hour from now. And yet God controls all of the stars and the moons and the galaxies. Frederick Schiller once said, the universe is one of God's thoughts. <laughs> Think about that. How foolish our pride is. But it comes up against the God of the universe. And so God humbles the proud, but he also exalts the lowly. I have a friend who loves to root for the underdog. No matter, you're watching a game, he wants to know who's the favorite, and then he roots against him. Loves an, a Cinderella story. His favorite movie is Rudy. 
And why, why do we love the underdog? Well, I think it's because we are made in the image of God. And God loves the underdog. He loves the weak, the poor, the ones who know that they don't have it all together. How does Mary know that God is that way? Because she's proof positive. Look at how she sees, uh, how she starts her song. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. Why? Because Mary was great? No. But because he is mighty who has done great things for me. She's going to be blessed. And we call her blessed because God did great things through her. Not because she was great, but because God was great. Michael Card, he calls Luke's gospel the gospel of amazement. Because throughout the gospel, he's constantly showing people who are amazed at, by Jesus. And Mary is amazed that God would look at her. She's overwhelmed at the great things that he would do for her and through her. She was humble in her circumstances, but also in her opinion of herself. Earlier, she had told the angel when he had told her what was going to happen to her. Remember what her response is? He says, she says, I'm the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Do you hear the humility in that statement? She is, she is surrendering her rights. She's surrendering, in some ways, her hopes and dreams, even her body, for God's purposes. She was the perfect mother for Jesus because she was poor and lowly, but also because she was willing to be used by God. She was a nobody, but God made her a somebody. And here's the thing. Jesus, her son, was a loser too. He lost the kingdom of heaven to come and to live on earth. He lost his divine majesty and power to come, to be a little baby who had to be fed and clothed and burped and changed. Even lost his life for our sake. And yet after his resurrection, God highly exalted him Above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. The good news of Jesus is bad news for the powerful and the arrogant. It's about a radical reversal. That the weak and the poor will be exalted, but the proud will be humbled. The mountains will be brought low and the valleys will be raised up. Even if you're not a Christian, does it? This bring hope. Don't we all want this to be true? And does anybody root for Darth Vader and the Empire against Luke Skywalker and the underdog rebels? Don't we all want the arrogant bankers and financiers who destroy the housing market to be humbled and those who are left homeless or swindled to be raised up? Aren't we all glad that God finally puts an end to the terrible rulers in the world like Hitler and Stalin and allows the poor and the outcasts to be raised up and be given rights? That's what, God came, that's what Jesus came to do, to stop the playground bullies of the world, to help the orphans and widows and losers. Jesus' entrance into the world changed everything. And you and I get to be a part of that. But it doesn't happen all by itself. It takes faith. You have to recognize your own spiritual poverty and trust in Jesus to be exalted. You have to recognize that your sin made you a prideful enemy of Jesus, but that his grace can change you. You have to be humbled before you can be raised up. Duke Kwan is a uh, pastor up in D Washington, D.C., and uh, he wrote something really profound 
a while back about Christmas. He says this. He says, we've got Christmas all backwards. Contrary to our typical ways of celebrating the holiday, Christmas was never meant to be the exclusive possession of the merry. Qualification smiles. Or the holiday party insider. Qualifications social networks. Or the homeowner. Qualifications fireplace and Christmas tree. Or the lover. Qualifications are romantic interests. Or the wealthy. Qualifications financial ability to give impressive gifts. Or the family. Qualifications spouse, kids, matching sweaters. Instead, according to the original story, Christmas grace is for the social outcast, like the shepherds. The religious inquirer, like the magi. The heartbroken and confused, like Joseph. The poor and the powerless, Mary and the shepherds. The refugee being hunted down, Jesus. The ethnic outsider, the wise men. The sad and unfulfilled, Simeon. And the unmarried, childless and widowed, Anna. If we were to totally revamp our annual Christmas celebrations and traditions, rebuilding it from the ground up and realigning it with the true story of the Incarnation, what would it look like? What, what would it include or not include? How would it reflect Mary's song and the gospel of Jesus that the proud will be brought low but the humble will receive mercy? Let's pray. Lord, the, the world teaches us to look out for number one, to believe in ourselves, to be our own heroes. And yet you teach us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And Father, we look to you as the, the true source of strength, and the, the one who loves the unlovable, the one who cares for the outcast and the needy, the one who can raise us up when we need it, the one who gives salvation to those who come to him. Father, we're grateful for that. We're grateful for this story of Christmas, the story of the world, and that Jesus is for us, and that if he is for us, who can be against us? Father, as we meditate and reflect on what this season is all about, we pray that you would help us to align our expectations and our story with the story of the Bible. And uh, we pray this in the name of Jesus, the unexpected Savior.